So we're so glad to have you all, and we're so happy to have John Penny uh, present to us in today's luncheon series. John, this year, is a Berkman Center Fellow. He's also a research uh, fellow at the Monk Center at the University of Toronto, as well as a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute at Oxford University. Um, he's here to talk about uh, just a small piece of his work, the breadth of which focuses on privacy and security issues, censorship, um, and welcome, John. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to the to the Berkman staff for uh, helping me put this together, including Dan, who I uh, sent my slides to a uh, bit late this morning. So thanks uh, for putting that together. Uh, I also want to say that it really is uh, an honor to be able to come to the Berkman Center, not just as a fellow, but also be able to come here and speak uh, about internet censorship, given uh, the number of uh, you know real luminaries that have uh, done some work and taught us a lot about this space. Uh, many of whom are in the room today, um, and many of which who have previously sort of walked these hallowed and, uh, I guess, carpeted hallways previously. Um, so a bit of uh, a quick background into this. This is actually uh, some research that spun off my doctoral project, which concerns um, regulatory chilling effects online, and particularly looking at, uh, of course, uh, um, IP regulation, that sort of thing, in relation to the Internet. Um, this started as sort of some background research that sort of framing some of that um, uh, doctoral dissertation and project. And then when I got into some of the history, I found that there's like a lot of richness to it, it's a lot of layers, and I think it's actually maybe a project that I could sort of return to once I have the doctorate completed to <laughs> pursue down the road. Um, so what you'll be hearing today is some of my preliminary findings in some of that research and some, some very modest thoughts and some ideas that I've extra extrapolated from it. Now, in terms of InfoWars, when I uh, have in the, you know, sort of in the title, the remembrance of InfoWars past in relation to internet censorship, and what do I mean by that? Um, well, I certainly don't mean um, Alex Jones and InfoWars.com, more guns mean less crime. Um, I'm thinking about it in terms, so if you came here looking for a tribute to Alex Jones, you're not going to get it, sadly disappointed. <laughs> Um, everyone leaves the room. Uh, I'm thinking about in terms of information conflicts as between sort of nation states. So conflicts between countries about information. And typically these, uh, not all the time, but often these take the form of uh, disagreements about uh, global communications mediums because those are the mediums for which information is actually communicated around the world. Um, so the research actually involves, uh, the project itself result, uh, involves three case studies. I'll be talking about two more in depth here for time purposes so we can have um, a bit of a discussion. Um, that involves the telegraph and some uh, disruption of the telegraph during its time, uh, radio jamming in the post-war period. And the third is actually involves a direct broadcast satellite uh, disruption in the 1970s. Um, and hopefully I can provide a few ideas or modest uh, sort of uh, lessons to extrapolate for people who work in the space of censorship resistance, uh, but also some thoughts on global telecommunications technology and some of the patterns uh, by which the international community deals with um, that kind of technology. So why might I want to present about this today? Why is this sort of uh, important? Well, here's actually a headline from uh, yesterday, actually. So um, out of nowhere, uh, the Chinese government has started to uh, jam um, radio signals, um, sort of the BBC World Service uh, in English, uh, within China. And it's the first time they've done this since the Cold War. Um, and so this is sort of headlines. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, Cold War radio jamming a little bit later. So it's almost as if the Chinese government were giving me a shout out, if you will, uh, before my talk. Um, maybe that's not something I should be bragging about. Uh, so maybe I'll move on uh, from there. But what are f a few other reasons? Well, first, uh, history and knowledge. You know, we're some researchers in here. It's important to get the history right. Uh, but there are a number of uh, legal and policy questions that arise in this space. Um, people who work in the field of sort of censorship resistance and people who develop uh, circumvention tools, for example, tools that allow citizens to circumvent national censorship regimes often have a question as to whether people critique these, these kinds of exercises or efforts as maybe being um, questionable under international law or illegitimate under international law. There are questions about um, what role does cyber warfare play with respect to internet censorship. And those of us who work in this space, are there ways or some lessons that we can take from the past 
that lead to better out outcomes. And I'll have, I certainly won't provide answers to all these questions, but maybe a few ideas on some of these points. But also, there are some bigger questions. Um, so about the fate of uh, the internet as a technology itself, um, the, the direction of broader censorship trends, and the role of international institutions. Uh, so in recent uh, years, uh, there have been a few um, really fantastic histories done. Uh, one uh, done by Professor Richard John, Professor at Columbia, which deals uh, with sort of the national history of both the telegraph and the telephone, but really focuses it on a national U.S. sort of base level. So it's a great history, but it leaves out some of the international aspect of, of some of that history. Another one which you may be more familiar with is Professor Tim Wu's work, uh, Master Switch, in which he um, tells us about or introduces us to uh, this cycle uh, within information industries within the United States. Uh, this seemingly, maybe inevitable, but seeming pattern within these industries to move from uh, a pattern of openness and novelty towards centralization, monopolization, and closedness. And so the question that Professor Wu poses is, will this be the same for the internet? And one of the reasons that he gives that maybe it will be different for the internet is because of its differential internet in a sort of international character, if you will. So um, on the one hand, uh, while if you look at technologies of the past, um, whether it be uh, radio, spectrum uh, control, or the telegraph, you had national industries. Um, Professor Wu talks about how you know Google the, and and uh, I guess Yahoo and Apple companies that sort of dominate this space um, are actually truly international in character. So a few of the things that I think that I'll be able to provide here is maybe a few additional pieces, not necessarily to answer um, the questions that Professor Wu poses, maybe a few additional puzzles to the piece as to how uh, this international character of the internet may or may not be a way for us out of this sort of uh, cycle with respect to um, these kinds of technologies. Um, and in fact, I'm going to be introducing, and keep this in mind as I go through to the case studies, a different kind of cycle. And it's related to the cycle uh, that Professor Wu introduces, but it is different. Uh, and this is a, a cycle that I noticed within the case studies with respect to global communic telecommunications technologies on an international level and how they're dealt with in terms of international law and policy begins with sort of a period of novelty and consensus about it. So there's a great awe in the in understanding of the capability of it. And there's consensus that becomes reflected in some of the laws that really actually promote and facilitate greater global communications. The consensus, and it depends on the circumstance how long, it's usually a few years, uh, and that breaks down into a period of in international information conflict where there's sort of a tendency towards states to aim to control the technology. And then we move into um, either a kind of innovation which restarts a cycle very similar to the one that Professor Wu talks about. We have a new communication technology that comes along. We just sort of leave the one in the past. Or there's a different path involving intervention. I'll talk a little bit a bit later about ways that maybe we or those interested in preserving sort of internet uh, sort of freedom, uh, some of the things that we can do in the space uh, to prevent some of this conflict and control. So let's get at the case study. So the first has to do with um, telegraph cable cutting and censorship. So in the early 19th century you had the development of the telegraph, by the 1850s you had the first transatlantic cables uh, laid down. And this and by 1900, you really have a global communications network that's uh, developed. And, you know, we talk about an internet revolution, but really the telegraph fostered a global communications revolution. So on the one hand, it fostered more communication between uh, nation states. When you open channels of communication, it becomes more efficient. And there are some instances where crises were avoided um, by way of telegraph communication. On the uh, economic side, you really had a... Uh, a revolution in commerce and trade because the telegraph allowed for uh, trading uh, and other kinds of commerce to be planned in a more systematic way and more efficient way and which really promoted greater trade around the world. So here's actually a visualization of the submarine cable network as of 1895. And the lines that you see on this map actually represent both land-based and submarine cables. Um, and as you can see, it pretty much links the entire world, all the way from New Zealand down here at the bottom, um, all the way up to 
um, to the west coast of Canada and the United States. So everywhere it's linked. You can see a few hubs in the network, and I'll get to those in a moment because they become important as the network develops. But like all global communication networks, or like all maybe networks, uh, there were two important network vulnerabilities. The first were these hubs, and you can see uh, Europe, and in particular in Britain and parts, uh, areas in Britain which uh, uh, various Western European powers had control over, which were key network hubs, and they become points of control over telegram communications. So here's actually a cable way station. Um, so think of this if you want to think of for the computer scientists, uh, think about this as terms a sort of like a router uh, within the telegraph uh, uh, network. So you had people sort of working in here. They would receive a, a telegram from a certain destination. You can see some of these are labeled. You've got Gibraltar. You've got Old Vigo. Um, and then they would sort of, based on the telegram, they would then send it off to its uh, destination. These were around the world, and a lot of these were actually controlled by the British government by virtue of the British Empire at this time. Um, later, when telegram uh, surveillance and suppression becomes um, uh, sort of proliferates during the First World War, you actually had people in these spaces um, surveying the telegraphs and suppressing them. And the people in there were called censors. So that's where we get our name censorship today. So these become populated uh, during the First War beyond people just mechanically routing messages as they come through the cable way stations. Uh, the other vulnerability had to do with the cables themselves. They're very rudimentary. Now, while submarine cables were actually a lot more uh, secure as compared to, as compared to land cables, um, if you had the right equipment, it was very easy to sever them. Uh, so this is a cross-section of one of the early uh, submarine cables. It's a, uh, a combination of uh, some steel, some copper, and that sort of green substance you see in the middle there uh, is a, an early uh, rubber-like polymer uh, that originated in India called gutta parcha, and it was used in some of these early kinds of cables. Um, so in response to some of these vulnerabilities, because so there were these early conflicts like the Pangida crisis in 1885, where Russia, in order to isolate Britain during that crisis, severed a number of British cables, the international community came back with a very strong consensus. Um, and the consensus was that we really want to facilitate global communications and protect this network. So you have a few imp key pieces of international law put in place. The 1875 Telegraph Convention, finalized in St. Petersburg. And if you really look, go back and look at this, it really is idealistic compared to some of the things that we talk about today in relation to the internet. You had codified in this document a universal right to communicate by telegraph. It also had a mechanism to preserve and protect um, communications as they go through the network, including some of these network hubs. And that was by virtue of this notice. So if you were someone who wanted to suppress a cable, that is, prevent it from continuing on to its de destination, it had this mandatory notice requirement that you provide a notice to the sending party that you weren't passing on the telegraph. And while there's some recognition of national security concerns, there was no <coughs> exception to this notice requirement in the convention itself. There was no convention for national security concerns of states. There was no exception for cultural mor morality concerns. And in fact, there was also a provision that expressly encouraged and provided for encryption. So parties were encouraged to encrypt some of their messages at this time, which provided for a lot of privacy amongst the communications. In terms of cable severing, you had the 1884 Cable Convention, which was established, which um, prohibited any kind of cable severing um, and provided some remedies for both states and for um, non-governmental, uh, both companies and organizations to seek redress if their cables were <coughs> severed. Um, however, just to, as a note there, there are no provisions concerning cable cutting during war, and that becomes important. So you have this early consensus, which leads to a legal framework internationally, both law and policy, which really promotes the technology and global communication, sort of like a golden era, if you will, of the telegraph. And it becomes highly effective during peacetime. The problem is, as with many technologies, is that States start thinking about, well, how can we use this to our national interest? And Britain, in particular, is a key player because a lot of the national and international infrastructure with respect to the submarine global network is owned and controlled by Britain. 
and they start realizing that if you have the telegraph plus surveillance and control, it can lead to a bigger empire, both commercial advantage as well as national <coughs> security advantage. But the problem is that they had tied their own hands by signing on to all these conventions. And to their credit, they realized that any kind of surveillance infrastructure they had built up at this point was probably illegal, and they actually ramp it down. Unfortunately, war becomes the way out. So there's a small amendment done in 1908 to their service regulations to the Telegraph Convention. The record on really how this is done, no one really knows, sort of lost in the annals of history, but I suspect Britain is the party that's behind it. So in 1908, the service regulations are amended to add a national security exception. That is to say that if you have, if it would be dangerous to national security um, to provide notice to a sending party if you decide to suppress a cable, then you don't have to send that notice. So as a result of this small exception added in 1908, during the war, it's interpreted uh, as allowing sort of full-scale kind of surveillance and suppression of notice without anyone. So um, what happens is, is during the First World War, and actually just a bit of history, that um, cable cutting is one of the first premeditated acts of the First World War to isolate Germany. Um, a lot of its cables are severed by France and Germany across the Atlantic. Um, during the war, you have a lot of um, wartime surveillance built up. So you have sensors populating these cable hubs, you have an entire infrastructure built up, including cryptology and crypto cryptologists to be working on some of the um, cryptography being used by governments to uh, maintain privacy in their messaging. And a lot of that wartime surveillance infrastructure later in peacetime becomes permanent. So uh, in terms of the history, uh, the cryptology school that had developed within the British government later becomes what we now to know today as signal intelligence agencies like the GCHQ, government communications headquarters. So an interesting sort of history there. It's actually the telegraph surveillance that leads to what we view as signal intelligence today, like the NSA and GCHQ. So we have this pattern, the consensus breaks down, and you have a mess of both surveillance and control, which leads to paralysis in terms of international law. And really nothing is resolved. No one goes back to the table and tries to fix this wartime exception. And so parties and countries start going to other avenues for redress. You have some international litigation concerning cable cutting. It's largely unsuccessful, but in some instances, countries are shamed into paying. And nothing is really settled in terms of the principles involved, other than the notion that cable communications between neutral countries, that is to say not engaged in hostilities, are invaluable. That is, you cannot sever those kinds of communications and cables. Uh, and that's codified in the fourth Hague Convention in 1908. What restarts the cycle into our second case study is innovation. Um, these questions are never settled because we move to um, a different kind of technology. First, we have the development of the wireless telegraph, which leads to the development of radio, which is our second case study. <clears throat> so high-frequency radio jamming in the post-war period is the sort of second example or um, uh, case study that we'll look at. During the Second World War and in the post-war period, there are two big problems that the world community uh, decides it needs to deal with. First is the problem of war propaganda, and, radio, and second is radio jamming during the Second World War. So on the, if you think about Germany, one of the things that Germany deployed in the Second World was something called broadcast uh, defense. Uh, whereupon to promote, and not just Germany, but a number of countries um, both used war propaganda to promote the war effort and also jammed any, any international signals from crossing their borders to prevent citizens from getting any information about what really was going on beyond the war propaganda. So these were two problems that had to be dealt with. The solution, at least in the estimation of the world community at this time in the post-war period, is this technology. So around this time, shortwave radio starts to proliferate around the world, allowing for um, mass populations to receive high-frequency, long-range radio uh, communications um, across borders, but uh, not just across borders, but across several countries, you know, beamed across Europe, uh, all the way to Russia and other parts of Asia. So this is a shortwave radio. And along with it, you have this strong consensus in the post-war period. 
Uh, this notion of a free flow of information paradigm is promoted by most of the world's great powers, and it becomes recognized in a number of uh, the key international documents at the time. You see it in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the ICCPR, as well as the UN's Declaration on Freedom of Information uh, in 1946, which was actually issued in the very first session of the United Nations Assembly, in which it declares that freedom of information is the foundation of all other human rights. And so you have, again, this sort of strong notion of consensus that's reflected in the international law, which, as we learn, actually promotes global communications at this time. And really enter um, what I view as the golden age of radio. Um, that is to say, uh, there's actually no jamming in the post-war period of radio signals around the world. So to me, the golden age of radio is less about listening to Orphan Annie here in the 1940s uh, it's more about uh, this, that is consensus, and uh, this is actually the first session of the UN uh, Economic and Social Council. We have strong consensus about uh, the importance of the free flow of information across um, borders, and it's reflected in the international law at the time. Unfortunately, that consensus, again, in terms of a pattern, it breaks down as countries start to realize the potential of the technology including its threat in terms of their own sort of stability and existence. So the Soviet Union views a lot of the radio signals that are now being beamed after the Second World War um, as a threat. And in 1948, the consensus breaks down. It begins to jam American and European radio signals, Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. And they do so, and they continue to do so for, all, for the better part of half a century, 40 years later. So again, you've got a consensus breakdown, which leads to Cold War information conflicts um, and a real messy situation. Uh, but the difference is, and there's some differences here com as compared to the telegraph, in the sense that these information conflicts are fought uh, not just on the battlefield, but also within international forums. And so the United States and its Western allies that are still promoting this notion of free flow information, they continue to advocate for it amongst international institutions rather than withdrawing from them. Uh, and that leads to a few different results. And one in particular I wanted to talk about because we're talking a lot about the ITU today. But there's one program that the ITU implemented at this time that really gets very little um, coverage and attention. There's very little scholarship actually done on it. And it was one that was implemented by uh, the then enforcement arm, and really at the time ineffectual, because the ITU is really an institution that's based on consensus. At this point, consensus is broken down, so really it's, there's not much the ITU can do about this breakdown in global communications and radio jamming going on. Um, but a program that was uh, implemented um, after lobbying from the United States and some of the Western allies, including the UK, Canada, and a few other countries. But the IFRB, the International Frequency Registration um, Board, which is the enforcement arm of the ITU, implements a radio jamming monitoring program, which I think was really interesting, and there's not much out there on it. So it was established in 1984 when radio jamming around the world is actually at record levels. So it's not just in Europe. So the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc alleys are all... Um, jamming radio, but there's also radio jamming happening in other parts of the world, including the Middle East, and it's spread to Asia as well at this point. It is a very sophisticated, internationally coordinated, so the ITU is able to use its international uh, sort of connections, and also working with the Department of Commerce in the United States to coordinate this in place strategically around the world, radio finding um, and harmful emitters uh, detectors around the world, and it's very, a very technically sophisticated program. And they issue reports, and there's not just annual reports, but also sort of quarterly reports that are constantly going out, but more official reports are tabled in 85, and 86, and 87. Here's actually a, an excerpt from one of the reports uh, where <laughs> it maps a number of the locations. It basically outed countries and provided a record of where some of the harmful jamming was located. And that includes the Soviet Union, Western Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc states, Iran, Eastern Europe, a number. So this is just one of the reports. And there's a number of other smaller countries in other reports um, that were fingered and shamed as well. Um, the actual impact 
uh, of this program is pretty remarkable uh, in the sense that following the reports, um, jamming immediately came down significantly, especially in Eastern countries. Now, uh, Eastern Bloc countries in terms of allies of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union continues to uh, jam. It's really undeterred. But some of the small, some of its smaller allies actually diminish a lot of their jamming at this point. So one thing to note is that blocking uh, and jamming is actually very costly. And I think if we're to think of maybe the causality here, if there is any, the IFRB really added an international reputational cost to the practice. And a lot of these smaller companies, sorry, countries didn't want to step into the big um, information conflict between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union, who are sort of battling it out of freedom of information versus the right to jam and sovereignty. Uh, so that's just a little bit about the IFRB program, and I'll come back to it later why I think it's important. Um, but it provides a little bit of a different orientation for international institutions uh, where you have a lack of consensus. The third case study, and I won't uh, be going too far in depth into it, um, because I'll get in a moment to some of the ideas or lessons that I've taken away to, from some of these case studies. But it relates to direct broadcast satellite television scrambling in the 1970s. Uh, and again, this technology, communication satellite technology, follows a very similar pattern internationally. It begins uh, with sort of a golden period, a golden era, if you will, of novelty and consensus, uh, sort of a, a, a real belief in the hope of communication satellite. It becomes reflected in treaties like the Treaty on Outer Space, 1967. Uh, that breaks down, however, as countries realize the invasive potential of the technology. And that really comes uh, uh, home to roost with the development of direct broadcast satellite television, where you can have signals directly um, beamed into the homes of people within countries and nation states. And that leads to, again, a breakdown of consensus. And internationally, a number of ideas start being promoted. Uh, but one of the things that I want to note uh, in terms of the international law in point, there's a consensus of international legal scholars at the time that um, the traditional arguments about national sovereignty, uh, that is the right to censor as a state, are actually seen as not able to justify satellite scrambling and signal at this time. They had to come up with a new framework. And so new ideas are proposed, an idea of prior consent, that is, if you want to communicate across borders, you need to get the prior consent of the receiving nation. Luckily, the United States and other countries start um, advocating against it, still pushing free flow um, ideas, and so they're able to prevent that from gaining any traction internationally, even though there's a few resolutions that are passed on point, including something called the Jammers Charter, something that justify radio jamming around the world, as well as scrambling of satellites. Um, none of that really um, catches on, but again, you're ending up with the same kind of cycle of problematics. And maybe you could say the next significant technology that we have is the internet. So um, what are some of the lessons and implications um, that I've taken uh, from some uh, of these case studies? Um, now, if we can re return to some uh, sort of, I guess, smaller, not really smaller questions, but I think more practical international legal issues that come up, um, some policy and practical issues as well uh, that we talked about in the beginning. Um, in terms of people working in the space of censorship resistance, if you will. So there's, it's often said that there really is an international legal impasse, um, or there's an, sort of an impasse under international law as to the legality or legitimacy of these kinds of um, programs. The idea of um, promoting and developing censorship circumvention tools by one state or by non-governmental organizations, and whether that really is um, legal and sound under international law. I would argue that if you go back and look at the history, and unfortunately international lawyers, and I can say this because I'm a lawyer, um, you know, they're, they're not really great on looking back at the history um, of the development of some of these international legal norms. But if you actually look back, you look at the documents which reflect the free flow doctrine after the post-war period, if you look back at the telegraph conventions and dealing with this notion of a universal right to communicate by telegraph, and you look at um, some of the consensus about the justifications for satellite scrambling, that is to say that none of these sovereignty arguments could really justify it. There needed to be an additional sort of framework um, proposed. I think there's a very reasonable and sound argument to say that censorship circumvention and the people working the space 
are doing something that is actually entirely defensible under international law is entirely legitimate. So if you are someone who works on circumvention tools and someone calls you an imperialist, we'll tell them that John Penny says they're wrong. <laughs> Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of cases, uh, the, I think the cases also suggest that censorship justifications historically are a lot more narrow than they're often articulated today. So, um, and I think a great example is the most important one that's often touted is the national security. And if you look back at the Telegraph and you look at the post-war period, those were much more narrow, even in times of war, um, in terms of the circumstances in which you could invoke national security to actually censor not just communications coming into your country, but across borders and to jam them as well. So a few sort of thoughts on the international law side of things. Um, secondly, there's this tendency amongst policy analysts working in this space um, about internet and sort of like uh, policy and governance and cyber warfare. And I think, unfortunately, academics are starting to pick up on this language as well, using Cold War and warlike analogies for understanding some of these challenges. And I think we really need to resist those kinds of analogies, because historically, um, it's the case that during war, as opposed to peacetime, um, that censors in states are, it's much easier to justify censorship at war. And that's just a reality of the international legal and policy framework that's out there, and that's really demonstrated by some of these case studies. So I think we ought to resist these because really it ends up in a space where we're more likely to lead to more international um, and internet censorship. Um, thirdly, um, one of the other lessons is that when you have this breakdown of consensus um, and a lot of uncertainty at the international level, um, parties start looking for redress in other venues. Um, and that includes uh, different kinds of national and international litigation. Um, and there's a growth of international law and liability that's happening right now. And for those who are working in the space, uh, they ought to be aware of this uh, and the potential for some liabilities, uh, even though I think under international law, what people are doing, for example, in developing circumvention tools um, that are out there and working on censorship resistance, have a good defense under international law. Uh, they had to be aware of some of the developments. There's a case study there, but that could be an entire presentation unto itself. Uh, in terms of the Alien Tort Statute, <coughs> Haystack being a very flawed circumvention tool that had been promoted, and some potential liabilities, i.e. if somebody who used, maybe a citizen of Iran who used Haystack, ends up getting caught, um, what are some potential liabilities for someone who might develop such a technology? That's something to keep in mind, because I think we're in this point of lack of consensus in relation to the Internet. But finally, let's finish with a few of these bigger questions about the fate of the internet. Um, I don't have the answers uh, for you, uh, but maybe there's a few ideas that we can take away. So um, Tu says, will things be different this time? So the cycle that he presents in terms of information empires in relation to the internet, will things be different? Well, my answer, like Professor was, well, I'm not really sure, um, but <laughs> Maybe what we can take uh, at least away from some of these case studies, we can understand the cycle in relation to the international level. So where are we right now in terms of the Internet? I think we've just finished, unfortunately, not to get dark about this, but I, the golden era of the Internet, if you will. That is to say, um, and if you believe the testimony of FCC Commissioner Roger McDowell, who just testified at Congress and said what this whole ITU and WCIT thing about in December is really about a breakdown of this consensus about even though you had censorship, it was sort of a hands-off approach by governments in terms of regulated on an international level. We've now left that consensus stage and we're moving towards a darker period of information conflict and a move towards greater uh, control. And so I think that is really what the challenge is in relation to the International Telecommunications Union and the World uh, Convention, so the World Conference on International Telecommunication just past December, which raised the hackles of a number of internet activists and evangelists like Vinton Cerf um, that really opposed any greater, or sort of this threat of an internet takeover a coup um, by other countries via the ITU. So is this all uh, necessarily dark? Um, 
not necessarily, but a few lessons that I would um, pitch to um, people who do care about the internet and some of these issues are this. So first of all, that information wars uh, in the coming years will be fought not just in cyberspace, and what we're seeing uh, every single day with some of the uh, offensive um, technological weapons and some back and forth between the United States and China and hacking and that sort of thing, but also importantly, it'll be fought in these international forums. And so that means that for those both countries that care about international freedom and as well as activists, the key is not to just be negative about it, not to just withdraw from these international institutions, but continue to fight the battles for the free flow of information at that time. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in relation to the discourse around the ITU was that the people uh, were articulating uh, or were basically uh, defending the internet in entirely negative terms, in the sense that they're saying the ITU should just keep its hands off the internet and stay away. Um, the problem with that is that if you entirely withdraw and provide no positive vision for the role that international institutions can play, and if we believe the testimony of Roger McDowell, CC Commissioner, that the ITU is actually very committed to redefining its role in relation to the Internet in the coming years, the ITU is not going to go away. And if we withdraw, we're leaving it over to the censoring countries, whether it's Russia, China, Iran, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia. If we withdraw and leave these institutions to them, then we're handing the keys over to them in terms of the future international law and policy, which I would argue, and I've attempted to show with some of these case studies, actually can have a positive role. And so I think the IT, if you look at its history, is not all negative. I think it's right for us to say it should keep its hands off in terms of international governance. But when we have this breakdown of consensus, what is a role? Or we, should, we ought to articulate, articulate a vision that these international institutions can play in this space. And I think one of them can be uh, this IFRB monitoring program. In a way, I view it as almost a, an early international precursor to modern efforts to map and visualize internet censorship around the world. So um, think of it as sort of a precursor to the Open Net Initiative, if you will, which was mapping the location of radio jammers around the world. Um, so maybe a vision or role for the ITU um, today and tomorrow given this lack of consensus, is in international governance, but is persuaded to take on a role in relation to the internet that it took on with respect to radio jamming. That is to say, maybe an IFRB or an ITU-backed international censorship monitor. So watching the watchers, monitoring the monitors again uh, in a way that maybe could facilitate um, greater uh, communications by the internet and maybe dissuade, maybe not China, maybe not Russia, maybe not the bigger companies like Iran that are committed to censorship, but smaller countries that can be shamed out of censorship, maybe a program like this um, could be the answer. Uh, so uh, that's all I have to say uh, on it. Um, thank you for uh, listening uh, very quietly <laughs> during the presentation. And so I, I welcome any questions or comments on anything that I have to say. Thanks, guys. So what do I just sort of, uh, I have Ryan? <laughs> so with this uh, shaming aspect, given the fact that, uh, that you know, China, Iran, Russia have very well publicized uh, and, you know, uh, acknowledged censorship regimes on the internet, uh, what are your concerns that rather than you know, the benefit of some kind of shaming regime that, in fact, you have very public uh, countries that can provide some kind of, I guess, political justification for these smaller countries to say, you know, well, you know, if China's doing it, you know, if we do 75% of what they're doing, we're still better than them, so you have no right to, you know, go after us. Hmm. You know, so what, what do you think about that tension? So the idea that... Um as long as you have certain countries like uh, China and, and Iran, for example, that have very publicized sort of, um, they're like, we're out there, we're sensitive of the internet, we're not ashamed of it, so how, how might sort of a, a mapping program actually impact on that? Well, I think it's a good question. I think maybe my answer is to, to look back at some of the history around the Cold War in terms of the radio jamming. In the sense that I think you had a similar dynamic. I mean, you had both the Soviet Union and its um, allies in the Eastern Bloc uh, that were just very open about their jamming of uh, radio signals within Europe. 
um, as they enter both their countries and Eastern Europe, but also the Soviet Union. But because of that um, sort of conflict between uh, the West and the Soviet Union and its allies, um, uh, I think there's a lot of other countries that had, you know, felt they're in their national interest to do some kinds of radio jamming. But once they were exposed, they didn't want to step in the middle of the giants, right? I think similarly today, while I don't think, I think we could map China's internet re uh, censorship regime in Iran and some of these countries until um, the cows come home and they're not going to be deterred. But there's going to be some smaller countries um, that once we add a international reputational cost. So think of like the open Air initiative with an international platform um, at the UN or something like that where you could table a report saying here is here's what these countries are doing, and you have sort of an international way of shaming some of these countries. I think maybe history has shown it can have an impact on some countries. And I think part of this, too, is that I think some of the researchers and activists that work in this space, we focus too much on. We spend a lot of time on um, China and Russia and Iran, these more sophisticated countries with more sophisticated systems. I think it's better to focus uh, sort of on a better result, better outcomes if we look at smaller countries that are doing internet censorship, but are because they sort of have lips, pay lip service to human rights and freedom of expression, they're more likely to relent if there's a little bit more international exposure for what they're doing. Is that? To what extent are these conflicts caused by countries having different views of copyright or different views of libel. It seems like, for instance, if, if the U.S. had passed the SOFA law last year, then we right. would be put on the same list by other countries. Right. So um, and maybe, maybe this is another reason to say um, how we're entering this sort of, uh, we're, th this consensus that I talked about, which um, I think is apparent internationally with respect to some of these communication <laughs> technologies. It's breaking down internationally, but also uh, domestically. So I think maybe so. I think Twitter was, was forced to block certain tweets from Germany because there was a libel case in that country. I can't right. remember the, the, the details, but I know there's, there are well-publicized differences between libel laws in the U.S. and in, and in England that uh, leads to something <clears throat> being published here and not, and not there. I was wondering, to what extent is this the root of the problem you're talking about? No, I, 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 think, that, I think that's definitely a, uh, an important factor in it, right? I mean, and part of this pattern that you see uh, with some of these technologies, it's uh, where you move from sort of the golden era, and I'm boring that actually line from Professor Wu, who describes it in his cycle, but I think what I'm talking about is a different kind of going in terms of international consensus. Part of the reason why that breaks down is that each country, each nation starts, starts thinking about its own national interests, both internationally and domestically. And on the one hand, they say, well, okay, well, we need to, you know, control and uh, and sort of rein in this technology domestically for these domestic interests. So in the sense, this would be the IP industries, for example, copyright laws, that sort of thing. So it's a combination of um, countries and uh, states realizing they've got to um, control the technology domestically, but also realize, uh, I think for other countries, it's more of an international threat, right? So the interesting dynamic of the United States is that it promotes sort of, you know, internet freedom abroad, while at the same time passing and attempting to pass something like SOPA at home. So it's sort of the Janus-faced nature of the problem. I remember a conflict between the U.S. and Canada about 10 or 15 years ago, which, which involved a, a murder case that you know, could not be covered in by Canadian news media under their laws while a jury trial was in progress, while in the meantime it was being reported here and you know, transmitted over the internet right. there. Right, absolutely. And I, and I think part of this is you can't answer the, this puzzle, uh, the puzzle that, you know, that, that Professor Wu has attempted to, to, um, uh, to tackle, and really his work is a, uh, is a fantastic uh, piece of uh, history. Um, but I think you really need to also look at the international history and understand the ultimate trajectory of the Internet, and you have to look at both of these things. Um, so, not to put you on the spot, but are there, uh, but I'm going to anyway, are there telecommunication, like, telecommunications platforms or technologies that don't follow your cycle? And, like, um, why do, and if they, do, if there are, if you can think of an example or two, like, is there a reason you think that they don't sort of match up to the way you've mapped out uh, international consensus? Um, I, off the top of my head, uh, I don't know of any uh, telecommunications technologies. Um, I'd be open to, uh, I mean, these are sort of the, the I, I focus on these because these were sort of three um, sort of examples where um, you actually had an international framework that resulted from sort of a promotion of these technologies internationally. Um, I mean, there's other kinds of telecommunications technologies like, say, telex, 
and a few others that allowed for, and even, I mean, wireless, the wireless telegraph. So I talked a bit about the cable-based telegraph. The wireless telegraph, I think, is sort of in the middle. And the way, I guess, if you're to look at that as a separate technology, it may not follow the pattern because in ways it was a transitional technology where we're moving from the cable-based, land-based, submarine-based telegraph uh, towards um, radio technology. And so you had the wireless telegraph, which was still important during the First World War and the Second World War. But by the Second World War, you had actually radio technology and high frequency and you know, shortwave radio developed. And that becomes the real technology that the World Community promotes and, and focuses on. Um, I'm interested to know uh, how much your research has touched on quantifying or qualifying what the actual positive impact of information access is, right. or is it simply a background assumption that information equals good, information equals Oh, so am I being empirical? <laughs> um, well, I can say my doctorate is empirical. Uh, whether, uh, I mean, this was more, so my, my methodology here is mainly historical, right? Uh, and the, because that's really how the project began. It was sort of a, uh, sort of a, a historical background uh, to frame my, my doctorate, which actually looks at data in respect of um, regulatory chilling effects uh, online. Um, and so this was sort of just looking at a few other instances of other global communications technology and, and some of the um, uh, sort of the trends that I noticed as I got into the history. Um, as to whether I can, I have um, data that shows you uh, that in terms of positive outcomes, in terms of um, greater global communications facilitation, not like hardcore data, but I guess what I do is historical data. In the sense that um, if you look at, uh, in terms of um, peace versus conflict, um, the greatest periods of, of um, lack of hostility uh, seem to be in these case studies, uh, where lack of war and is around the times where you have greater communications and these technologies really being promoted and facilitated. So in the post-war period, you have no jamming whatsoever anywhere around the world, and you also have this great consensus um, uh, if you look at um, the period leading up to the First World War, you've got this great consensus about um, the importance of the telegraph um, and its facilitating uh, communications and commerce and a lack of war. And that changes during the First World War. And maybe it's a, an, a chicken egg, egg chicken sort of thing, um, correlation and causation. But they seem to coexist. And so maybe that's one bit of historical data that I can offer you, at least a nugget to answer your questions of whether... Um, Internet freedom can lead to better outcomes, maybe. Um, one thing I think you kind of leave out in your analysis, and I know this certainly from the first, the, the second and third um, case studies, is the, certainly from the U.S. perspective, the offensive nature of the communication mm. method and its ability to cause political change, democratization, mm -hmm. um, freedom. I mean, the golden age of radio that you're talking about was very, very short. The Soviet Union always controlled all domestic broadcast. It was mm -hmm. only when the United States and Britain and then a couple of others decided that they would break that monopoly by broadcasting into the Soviet Union that they decided that, gee, the, you know, setting up hundreds of jamming stations was worthwhile. Right. So, I mean, I'm saying there's, there's an also, and this is very true of the Internet, there's sort of an offense that this will lead to a more democratic society. That's great. Let's push this. And then oftentimes the government say, hey, wait a second. All these guys think that this is this great technology to get rid of us. Right we're going to start pushing back. And we'll push back not only on the technology, but in international forums about how it's defined. Right. No, I think that that's absolutely right. And I think um, you certainly see that with um, what we talked about earlier in terms of this sort of like this dual-faced uh, policy that you have in the U.S. government, which on the one hand, you've got um, you know, greater control and clamping down on internet freedoms domestically, but then promote, you know, the State Department out there promoting international freedom, right, sort of internet freedom abroad. Um, I guess in terms of... Uh, um, the case studies that I've talked about, I think what you talk about is exactly right. I think it sort of, if I were to fit it into the cycle, um, I would argue that um, it's around the time where you're right. The, the golden era is very short lived, and it's usually what happens is you've got the introduction. There's novelty about it, its capabilities, but then countries start realizing it's a it's a real threat, especially once. And I guess in your view, out of the offensive capabilities of the communications, um, maybe from a different angle of view, it's just the ability to foster communications across borders. And so that when they realize this, they're like, like you say, it's much, it's, we can incur the cost of jamming this stuff because it really is a threat to, you know, so our, you know, communist program or whatever it is, whatever domestic or cultural agenda they want to promote. 
Um, and so that's really when the consensus breaks down. So you're right. It's, um, so I didn't mean to leave it out. Uh, I guess I would just sort of come at it from a diff different sort of angle of view in the sense that um, it's part of the cycle and that it, the history, uh, this is when the countries start to understand the true potential of the technology, whether it's, it's offensive or defensive capabilities. And that's when you yeah, had the consensus breakdown. Ruha? Um, just going back to the shaming <clears throat> issue, um, and I, I haven't studied the Cold War too much, but my understanding then of those countries that, that you mentioned that was sort of in the middle, yep. um, and it being revealed that they were actually jamming when they were pretending they weren't, um, do you feel that, that um, the reduction of jamming was, was correlative with the, um, I guess, the idea that... <coughs> They were playing with both the U.S. and Russia in terms of, um, you know, they were they're, they're dancing between both of them in terms of getting benefits for appearing to be partnering with both. And to do that behind um, closed doors, it, you know, it worked, but as soon as those doors were opened and it showed that they, were, they actually were jamming, they were working with Russia, then the U.S. and all the benefits and incentives that came with partnering with the U.S. So, really, the shaming is tied with economic incentives, yep. or political, economic and political yep. incentives, and it's the same thing today with the internet. The smaller countries um, that censor but pretend not to censor benefit from economic and political go goodwill from countries like the U.S. and right. and so on. And so, shaming them really is revealing um, their alliances to. To different things, which then gets rid of those incentives. So, I, I guess it's not a question, uh, but it's it's what's behind that shaming. Right. What, what are the incentives and disincentives that are behind it? Right. No. No. I think it's a, it's a great point to make. And in fact, I mean, I didn't talk about it, but um, in the in the nineteen seventies, in response to direct broadcast satellite. Uh, you've got this sort of additional movement that develops internationally. So you've got you've got the West on the one hand, and you know so the United States and its allies. You've got Soviet Union and its sort of uh, more um, censorship oriented um, uh, and you know, radio jamming and satellite scrambling sort of allies. And then you have a number of third world countries, and it's 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 it has a name. It's called the third world movement, basically, where um, they say that you know we 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 like communications technologies and we could benefit from greater access to it. It's sort of that north-south, east-west uh, concern. And so it's, it, their goals are a little bit different, but they oftentimes will sometimes ally uh, with the United States uh, to promote these kinds of technologies. Sometimes they ally with the Soviet Union to promote um, regulation with respect to direct, direct broadcast satellite. Um, unfortunately, they fell to the side of more um, uh, scrambling and janning and censorship because they viewed um, uh, DBS as being a direct threat to their culture and sovereignty. So they looked to the international forums as a means of regulating and promoting and it was from the third world movement that actually proposed this idea of prior consent. Um, yeah, there's a few countries. So Brazil and India, um, I think um, Guatemala was actually interestingly a, a, a prime mover with some of this stuff. And you see a little bit of today with respect to the ITU. So the head um, of the ITU, actually I'm going to forget at the top of my head, but he, uh, in terms of where he's from, uh, you know, he doesn't sort of swear allegiance to the West. Or the, he sort of comes from a third, sort of third world perspective in the sense that he, he's concerned about greater access to ICT for smaller countries. And, you know, he doesn't want to take sides in the information wars that are happening, but inevitably as being part of the ITU, he's finding himself a part of it. Um, in terms of the the, um, the first part of your question, I think it's I think it's a good point um, in that uh, you know maybe by providing uh, greater ex uh, shedding some more light on these practices, you're removing those incentives um, uh, and, and sort of those sort of like uh, darker um, uh, relationships or arrangements that are done you know without exposure. And then once we provide some shaming, it pr takes those incentives away. Um, I think on balance, I would say that, that you can justify it, but maybe um, there would have to be a way of still finding those incentives in other ways. So if we, um, we say, you know, censorship is not really the way to do it, um, we can help you with um, greater access to ICTs through other, you know, arms of the international law and policy apparatus as opposed to um, um, joining China and censoring along the way.
Right. Saintly Touré is from Mali, but he was educated in Mali. Moscow. Okay. Oh, right. That's right. That's right. He had both of his degrees in right. Moscow. Right. Um, I, there were two things. Well, just as an existence theorem, are there technologies which have, in which countries have not um, censored, or maybe they're not along far enough in their cycles? GPS. There are now several systems, mm. and so far, do we the, the, the it's not. It's different, obviously, because it doesn't have the same content. Right. But nonetheless, and you can also look in the Cold War, and there were agreements in which states agreed not to censor content. For example, it's illegal to to block uh, or to encrypt uh, telemetry in the START treaties and so forth. So, as existence theorems, you can imagine agreements. But I I was struck more by the point that you made in terms of your lessons for the internet, which is don't take wartime as a normal or as the paradigm case, because that's extremely important. It, it, you know, this imagery of the Cold War going to the internet is a terrible imagery. Sanger made it, made a mistake on this in his article in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, it's not a Cold War. Chinese censorship goes up and down. There are third party actors that play crucial roles, not just governments. Well, as to whether the censorship goes up and down. Censorship in Europe uh, is, I mean, is freedom, internet freedom in Europe is different than internet freedom here, and it can go up and down. So this variability means that there's much more room for negotiations, for trying to work out norms, for shaming some, even if you can't shame all. Uh, so I think that I thought the richness of your presentation came in in showing that uh, this isn't a binary war, non-war, it's a non-war, and therefore there's much more variability in it. I, I think this is a very important presentation. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Adam? I already got you, Ryan, so I'll get some more people. Yeah. I, I was curious to hear a little bit more about the potential future role of the ITU. Right. And I'm struck, again, by the similarity between the network and network node map you showed of submarine cables and what I imagine are virtually identical internet transmission line maps. Right. And so in addition to behavioral nudging from the ITU, I wonder, especially in light of the uh, third third world perspective you just right. mentioned, the answer right. if there might be a push to actually lay out um, more infrastructure in an attempt to prevent there from being nationalizable choke points? Right, right. I mean, uh, even today, I mean, if you look at, I mean, how does China censor the internet? Uh, I mean, we, well, I guess that's a whole other presentation. Um, but, you know, uh, it's really mapped in, in relation to the physical infrastructure of the internet within China, right? You've got some major ISPs, mm -hmm. which are basically um, handle ChinaNet, um, um, a few of the other uh, major ISPs, I think our research out there suggests that a lot of censorship is done at the um, AS level, the ISP level, uh, through NDS, based on rotors, edge rotors, you know, that, that are handling a lot of the incoming, outcoming sort of traffic um, in relation to China beyond the firewall. But I think the firewall uh, metaphor is a bad one. I think Panopticon, I think Jet Crandall is, is a better way of understanding um, it. But uh, you're right. I think a lot of this stuff is related to the infra physical infrastructure in the Internet. And if we can preserve um, some aspects of um, some greater sort of security towards communications and meet some of the concerns of um, other countries that aren't really uh, in this battle the same way China and other countries are. It's a lot more complex. Um, some of those countries that voted for the resolution that came out of the ITU in December, they're not on board with censorship. They don't really care about that. That's not, that's not their battle. They're more concerned about greater access. They're less wealthy. They're concerned about getting behind the... It's the digital divide that we've been talking about since the 1990s. So I think um, for our purposes, those of us who care about this, I think our, our war is not... our battle or the what we want to advocate is not just um, freedom and you know it's also understanding those concerns and trying to meet them in other ways so um, we don't lose these institutions and these countries that are concerned about those problems so I think that's a great point so just very, very sure <clears throat> is there any historical parallel with the ITU or oh. its predecessor organizations moving on that front as well like yes we're gonna have these agreements about encryption and censorship but guess what we're also going to try to lay more cables so that we don't have yeah. 
as many choke points. Right. So there was a movement in the 1980s towards uh, international right to communicate. And it was really promoted within UNESCO um, by some of these uh, countries. Um, but unfortunately, it became associated as the Soviet Union saw it and said, oh, this is great. Yeah, right to communicate. And they then took hold of the agenda and promoted it as another way of um, censoring. You know, so right to communicate includes um, the right to not communicate, which means we can censor whatever the heck we want. And it was basically hijacked. So it was a, uh, something exactly what you're talking about, a movement that began with concerns just about physical infrastructure for countries that want to be on board with communications and global communications technology. It gets hijacked by the censors um, within international institutions, which then forces the other countries, the United States, who withdrew from UNESCO, sort of withdrew funding, said, you know, we don't want any part of this, and sort of the idea died. So I think, uh, again, that's it. So I think that might have been something what you're talking about. Unfortunately, it got caught up, caught up uh, and died uh, as a result of Cold War information uh, wars and, and conflicts. Uh, thank you. That was a great talk, and I think uh, each of us will bring away her own thoughts. My comments, uh, I had somewhat the same uh, response as Joe Nye did, because it, I thought, to me, the most important point was the role of language, and uh, language, imagery, culture. And I thought, for people who are interested, one of, I think, the most important pieces written on this was by Laura Nader, an anthropologist many years ago, who spent time at the Pentagon showing how the language that came out of the Pentagon created a culture whereby they diminished the negative, hostile, dangerous impact of what they were doing. And I think this is very important uh, to think about. And so again, it was language, but uh, to show my Freudian roots, uh, I was thinking about uh, early childhood development okay. and the three different uh, technologies you elicited. And I thought, OK, let's look at the internet. That's the only one that came out of DARPA, the federal government, mm. the National Science Foundation only let go within relatively few years. Do you think what we're seeing has any difference because it's the government that created this in a warlike atmosphere uh, to deal with nuclear weapons uh, and it had its own culture and only later got turned over to the public, and really much later, and how would that affect uh, those three, the links among those three technologies. Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, wow. Uh, anyone got time to? Um, we got another hour, right, Almer? So he's saying no, no, John. Uh, consider it a thought. Sure. No. No. I no. I think it's a great point. I mean. And it takes us back to some of the um, already great work that's been done, I mean, on the architecture of the Internet as it was built, what its original aims were for, you know, this that famous line about, um, you know, uh, the Internet treats censorship as a problem and routes around it. And then the answer to that is, well, what if um, censorship is in the router, right? Uh, and and that, that's sort of how... Uh, um, but I think uh, you're right that are there things about the Internet, and this comes back to, I think, Professor, you think your question takes us full circle back to Professor Wu's question, is there something different about the internet? Its origins, its original purpose, its architecture that uh, leads to a different outcome here. Um, I really hope so, um, but I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, it might be that uh, it certainly has a kind, I think, of dynamism and flexibility that certainly the telegraph didn't, just where you could sever um, and you could you had these cable way stations that are you know easy to um, deal with, but that was sort of internationally controlled by one country. Basically, I mean, Britain really owned that infrastructure. Um, you don't have that with the internet, right? China owns its infrastructure, but it doesn't own um, everyone else's. So maybe there's aspects of the global internet network or the of the internet that are different. Um, but I think yeah, I mean it's it, it's a great question. Uh, you spoke of the new virtualism. Um, in doing this project, do you feel more positive or negative uh, after you learn about this? Uh, uh, oh, uh, do I feel well? I have to say uh, that you know, in terms of the you know Professor Wu's cycle, um, and uh, you know, I, I guess I, I thought that some of the insights here are a little bit dark, uh, in the sense that it seems like we've just left the golden era, if you will, if, this, if there is a, a cycle internationally, and there's, there seems to be a bit of it, at least with some technologies. And Kendra's pointed out there's probably other technologies that don't fit it. 
Um, I don't know if it's as inevitable as uh, as Professor Wu would say about his cycle, um, but I think there's certainly uh, the fact that we're now entering a, even though we've had internet censorship, we've had it for a while, and now we're entering a space where there's even going to be more, potentially more control. So some dark, and I think the point is that we need to think critically about it, understand the richness and the complexity of the problems, and tackle it that way. Um, maybe one more question, Jerome. Uh, wow, what a responsibility. Closing question. Um, yeah, so thanks for the very cool talk. Um, so when I was uh, hearing uh, about your your historical scenarios and the trends in them, I was I was thinking about a very strong parallel that popped up in my mind. It's basically the case of, of international trade, right? Which is basically the same thing in the sense that you got a consensus. Everybody agrees that trading with one another is good. So everybody benefits from it, right? right? But each and every time you get a moment of tension internationally, then people start to think and realize, well, if everybody cooperates but I don't, I get an even larger part of the cake. Right, right. Um, and so one thing that goes back to your shaming point is that something that has been really efficient at, cer at circumventing this, and we see that right now at, in this financial crisis, is, is international structures for people to talk to each other and reveal the information so that everybody knows what's going on. Right, right. Which is basically the WTO. Right. Um, so that sounds to me like a very like striking parallel between communication technologies and, and, and international trade and the way it works. Um, but I guess my, my, my point is, is different. Uh, I, I'm worried that, you know, um, in, in, in this circle that, that you described, I'm worrying about the role of conflict, actually, because if you think about it, we live right now in a world in which um, the number of conflicts worldwide is decreasing dramatically over the past 15 years, which is a fact. Um, even in, in this financial crisis, we have like very high growth rates worldwide. Right. So why would it be on Earth that would trigger a breakdown in the consensus, but the lack of coordination institutions like powerful like the WTO and I find this worrisome in some respects so what do you no I, I mean I, I I agree with you I think well first of all on your first point I think that's a great parallel and that you know the, this idea that opening up channels of information and exposing it maybe that's kind of like the shaming point but I think it's a, maybe another way that we could build out a, a different kind of resolution to some of these problems of censorship where you have different channels uh, of communication information so that countries that have some concerns, uh, there's a different outlook for them internationally. So that, that's one side of it. Um, secondly, um, you're right, I, I think there are some concerns um, uh, in terms of, you know, why might we, in terms of conflict, I think inevitably, and maybe that's why there is seemingly this cycle that while you start off with a uh, technology which everyone for a short, a very small period of time. The global era, the golden era is always short because it's very quickly countries start thinking about them in terms of their national interest, uh, both in terms of the threat that the technology poses and how they can, it's offensive technologies, how can you actually gain this to your own commercial um, or national security advantage. And I think you can look at that both in, in relation to the internet and the telegraph with Britain and that sort of thing. So you're right, I mean, that's maybe the darker side of this uh, this cycle is that uh, maybe we're inevitably, uh, why would there be any kind of conflict given the collective action sort of issues and some of the concerns? So it's it, it's a good one. Uh, I think we can uh, wrap that up. Uh, so thanks a lot, guys, for the great questions and uh, patiently working on this.